Life of Saint Anthony of Padua From the Seeker of the Lost, Saint Anthony of Padua, by Elaine Woodfield His name was Fernando de Bullion, and he was born in Portugal in 1195 on the Feast of the Assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary into Heaven. He came from a wealthy and noble family, and one of his ancestors was a crusader king. Fernando's father was the governor of Lisbon, Portugal's most important city, and Fernando was the heir to this governorship. Fernando's mother taught him a great love and devotion to our Blessed Mother. Growing up amid great wealth, Fernando was intelligent, handsome, kind, and virtuous. He was well liked and had many friends. But he was hearing another call for his life. While he was trying to decide what course to take for his life, he paid a visit to a church that was dedicated to Our Lady. He knelt on a marble step and gazed at the tabernacle, praying to Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament. All of a sudden, a horrible demon appeared before him. What should he do? Calmly, Fernando bent down and traced the sign of the cross on the marble step with his fingertip. The demon vanished at once. Looking down, a relieved Fernando was surprised to see the sign of the cross he had traced. It was carved deeply into the marble step, and it is still there today. Fernando had wealth, intelligence, a loving family, many friends, and good health. Yet Fernando could see that all that the world had to offer was not enough to fill the soul. O oh world, how burdensome you have become! Your power is only that of a fragile reed, your riches are like a puff of smoke, and your pleasures are like a treacherous rock whereon virtue is shipwrecked. He was to say. Fernando decided to become a priest in the order of St. Augustine. He would take the vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience. At age fifteen, he entered the monastery of St. Vincent in Lisbon. He was a diligent student, and he grew in holiness. His friends missed him, and kept visiting him at St. Vincent. They kept urging him to leave St. Vincent and come back to them. Fernando knew that he could not return to the worldly life. To remove this temptation, he asked to be transferred. At age seventeen, he moved to the Abbey of Santa Cruz in Coimbra, about one hundred miles from Lisbon. He spent the next eight years of his life at Santa Cruz, and there he grew in virtue. He was an excellent scholar. It seemed as though he knew the Holy Bible by heart, and he lived its teachings. Once he read anything, he remembered it perfectly. Today we would call this a photographic memory. He was ordained a priest, and continued his quiet life of study and service. Little did he know that his life was about to change completely. While acting as guest master one day, Father Fernando offered hospitality to some visitors. They were Franciscan priests who were on their way to Morocco to spread the gospel there. The Franciscan order was a new one in the church at that time. Brother Francis of Assisi founded it. Franciscans practiced strict poverty and penance in imitation of Christ, and they preached the gospel constantly by good example, reverence and prayer, kindness to all in need, and in rejoicing in all of God's creation. Most of all, a Franciscan life is a life of holy service and holy joy. The Franciscans loved God so much that they were willing to lay down their lives as Jesus did to bring his saving love to the people of Morocco. They were merry and jovial as they told him that they were likely to be martyred or put to death for giving witness for Christ there, since the Muslim leaders in Morocco were hostile to the Christian faith. The Franciscans did not fear death. They willingly faced this danger because wherever people die for the faith, the faith later grows strong. An old quote states, The blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. They wanted the Christian faith to grow strong once again in North Africa, and they were willing to offer their lives so that God would be glorified there. Father Fernando was very impressed with the faith and joy of his Franciscan visitors. Their example gave him a lot to think about. Only a few months later, the bodies of these Franciscans came to Quimba to be buried there. Indeed, they had been martyred just as they had predicted. As he attended their burial ceremonies, Father Fernando thought deeply about the lives and deaths of these saintly Franciscans. Finally, he came to a decision. He decided to leave Santa Cruz and become a Franciscan himself. So at age 26, Father Fernando became a Franciscan and took the new name Father Anthony in honor of the Franciscan hermitage of the same name nearby. He had only one request, 
to be sent to Morocco to give his life for love of God and of his fellow men. His Franciscan superiors agreed. Father Anthony sailed for the coast of Morocco with a fellow Franciscan, Brother Filippo of Spain. How eager Father Anthony was to preach the truth to those in darkness, and to give his life for love of them. But this was not to be. The two Franciscans reached Morocco safe and sound, but almost immediately Father Anthony came down with a terrible fever. He wasted away with sickness, and only the expert nursing of Brother Filippo saved his life. Word of this got back to Father Anthony's Franciscan superiors in Portugal, and they ordered Father Anthony and Brother Filippo to return to Portugal as soon as Father Anthony was strong enough to sail. Father Anthony regarded the word of his superiors to be the word of God and so the two Franciscans boarded a ship and sailed for Portugal. They had been in Morocco for only four months. They never made it. A sudden, fierce storm called a white squall whipped up the sea and diverted the ship far off course. The ship finally docked on the island of Sicily in the seaport town of Termina. Making their way to Messina, Father Anthony and Brother Filippo stayed at a Franciscan convent there. Father Anthony slowly regained his strength. To thank the friars of Messina, he planted a lemon tree near their home. While in Messina, Father Anthony heard some exciting news. In Assisi there was to be a gathering of all the Franciscans, called the chapter. Brother Francis of Assisi himself would be there. Father Anthony wanted to meet him very much, and to offer his service to the founder of the Franciscan order personally. So, he journeyed to Assisi with Brother Filippo and the other Franciscan friars from Messina. The chapter began on May 30, 1221. It was very inspiring for Father Anthony to see Franciscan friars from all over the world all assembled together in one place. Best of all for him was to see Brother Francis himself. But did they actually meet one another? No one knows for sure. Brother Francis was ill, and had only a few short years to live. Father Anthony was still recovering from his illness, and he looked very frail. It is possible that due to the ill health of both men, they did not actually meet. One of the purposes of a chapter meeting is to determine the new directions of service its members will take. For example, when it was announced that some Franciscan missionaries would be sent to Germany, 80 men volunteered to go there. Friars received new assignments to help the poor, to care for the sick, and to travel about preaching the gospel. Requests were made, needs were met, assignments were set in motion and it seemed as though everyone there received a new assigned task. Except Father Anthony. No one took any notice of him at all. He feared that the chapter would end and he would have no place at all to serve God. He spoke to different Franciscan superiors, but none of them wanted him. He even offered to work in the kitchen cooking for the other friars, since he knew that any task done for the love of God was pleasing to him. But the superiors took one look at the frail young man and told him no. Finally, Father Anthony found Father Gratian, who was the provincial, or superior, of the area around Bologna in Italy. Are you a priest? Father Gratian asked him. Yes, I am, answered Father Anthony. Father Gratian thought for a moment. Yes, I can use you as a chaplain to some friars who live in a hospice in the mountains. So for nearly a year... Father Anthony lived in the mountains with the Franciscan brothers and said mass for them every day. He even cooked for them and washed dishes and did small chores to help them in any way he could. One of the brothers stored his tools in a small cave. Father Anthony discovered this cave one day and asked the brother if he could have use of it. The brother gladly agreed. So Father Anthony cleaned it out and moved a straw mattress and a rock that he used for a pillow into the cave and made the small cave into a home. He studied the Holy Bible, and translated the Psalms, and wrote explanations called commentaries on each of the Psalms so that preachers would be able to explain them better. He prayed, meditated on the life of Christ, deepened his devotion to Our Lady, and did penance. Then one day, he was invited to an ordination. After his sermon at the ordination ceremony, Father Anthony's life would never be the same. His superiors sent him to a university so that he could learn theology. They assumed that he was not learned, but it soon was clear to everyone that Father Anthony was a brilliant man who already spent many years at study. So they sent him to preach to the people. The people needed good preaching, too. At that time, 
many people believed in strange beliefs called heresies. To believe in a heresy is to subtract some of the truth of the Catholic faith, and put lies in the place of the true beliefs that were subtracted. The heresies of Father Anthony's day had many different names, but they taught many of the same foolish things. These are some of the lies and foolish beliefs the heresies taught. All created things, including people, were evil. Only an elite few people were going to heaven. No one was responsible for his actions, and no crime of any kind should be punished. People should do whatever they wanted. These heresies ever taught that Jesus did not become man at all. These false beliefs had dreadful results. Because of these false beliefs, daily life was in a frightful, fearsome state for most people. No one was safe on the street or in their homes. Because parents deserted their children and spouses deserted each other, family life was in an appalling state. Bands of marauders roamed the countryside, robbing and beating and sometimes killing people. Crops were burned, and buildings and homes were destroyed. Priests were murdered and churches were ransacked. People quarreled with one another and fought and took revenge for trivial reasons. Wealthy people shamelessly mistreated the poor, because they knew that they would not be punished for anything they did. The police and the army did nothing to fight for the right or help the weak and the helpless. This disorder spread through entire sections of France, Italy, and beyond. What these people needed was to hear a preacher speak the truth to them. Father Anthony was the perfect man for the job. He and another Franciscan friar walked from town to town throughout Italy and southern France, preaching the gospel in each place. The results of his preaching were spectacular. The town of Padua, later to become Father Anthony's home, was a typical example. It was a disordered, crime-ridden town, full of theft and quarrels. Father Anthony went to the church and began to speak. One by one, people left their homes and businesses and drifted to the church to hear the new preacher. So many came that Father Anthony moved to the town square because the church was not big enough to hold all the people who wanted to hear him speak. Father Anthony's appearance was ordinary, and his words were just the good common sense of the gospel. Father Anthony was short and a bit round, and his face was full of gentleness and compassion. He spoke in a pleasant voice, but somehow even the people far in back of the crowd could hear him speak clearly and loudly. His words were understood clearly by the most learned and by the most simple people. His words cut them to the heart and made them very sorry for their sins. He reminded them of the love of God and the duty we have to act according to the teachings of Jesus. Hell was the destination of those who had turned their backs on God, but heaven was the reward of the just. Turn back to God before death comes and it is too late, said Father Anthony. The result of his words was extraordinary. Thieves went home and brought the goods they had stolen to the town square and laid these stolen goods at the feet of Father Anthony, who saw to it that they got back to their rightful owners. People who had quarreled for years forgave one another and embraced, weeping, in front of Father Anthony. People who had deserted their families came back to them to ask forgiveness and to start a new life together. People jammed the churches to go to confession and willingly waited long hours and long lines in order for Father Anthony to hear their confession and give them absolution for their sins. Everywhere people did penance and made restitution for their sins. And they begged him to stay with them and preach to them some more. In time, the town completely changed. Gone were the quarrels and the crime and the selfishness. In their place were justice and right and kindness. Father Anthony moved on to another town, and another, and another. When he entered a town, all the businesses, schools, and courts would close, and everyone would assemble to hear Father Anthony speak. Soon, the entire region was transformed. When Father Anthony was present, the extraordinary became ordinary. Miracles and wonders seemed to accompany him like a blessed shadow. Sometimes even the sight of him would cause sinners to repent of their sins in tears of relief. This is because of Father Anthony's goodness and virtue. Truly honest persons possess a harmonious and pleasant demeanor. Nothing reproachable can be found in their actions, nothing inappropriate in their words, nothing indecent in their manner. Being spontaneous and respectful, their behavior wins the admiration and goodwill of all, said Father Anthony. He was speaking to the people to encourage them in the pursuit of honesty, but he could have been describing himself. 
one sinner came to him in the confessional. He was so ashamed of his sins that he could not name them out loud. Father Anthony told the man to write them on a parchment and bring it to him. The man was able to read them from the parchment, but a strange thing happened. As he read each sin aloud to Father Anthony, it disappeared from the parchment. As Father Anthony gave the man absolution, the man noticed that the parchment was completely blank now. If you offend or hurt Christ by sinning grievously, as soon as you offer him a flower of regret or a rose of sincere confession, he immediately forgives your offenses, forgives you your sins, and hurries to embrace you and kiss you. Father Anthony said to sinners, A huge crowd gathered in the town of Limoges to hear Father Anthony preach. All of a sudden, huge black clouds rolled in, and some of the people prepared to leave before the storm broke. Fear not, said Father Anthony. The storm will pass you by. So everyone stayed. Father Anthony preached, and the storm raged. But it left the crowd alone. When Father Anthony was finished and the people walked home, they noticed that all the land around the area where they were had been flooded with rain, and hailstones covered the ground. It was just as Father Anthony had said, during his preaching not one person had been touched by the rainwater of the storm or by the hailstones. Father Anthony went to Rome and preached to the Holy Father the Pope and many of his cardinals at a special meeting called a consistatory. The cardinals were from all over the world, and they spoke many different languages, such as French, German, English, Greek, Latin, and the Slavic languages. To the amazement of all, each cardinal heard the sermon of Father Anthony in his native language. This reminded everyone of the miracle of Pentecost, in which people from all over the world heard St. Peter preach, each in his or her own language. The Pope himself was so astonished at this that he said, Truly, this man is the Ark of the Covenant and the vehicle of the Holy Spirit. Father Anthony lived at several different Franciscan monasteries during his life, and even became a superior at one of them. One of the young friars was tempted to leave his vocation to the religious life and return to the world. He crept into Father Anthony's room and stole a valuable book, his translation and commentary on the Psalms. The young friar then ran away with the stolen book. How strange to steal a holy book! Perhaps he was going to sell it for some money. Father Anthony somehow knew what was going on, and he prayed for the young friar. Coming to a bridge in the darkness, the young friar tried to cross it. All of a sudden, he saw an enormous dark monster who threatened to kill him if he took one step closer. The friar froze in terror. What should he do? In the blink of an eye, the friar came to his senses. He turned around and ran back to the monastery. It was a long journey, but at last he arrived. He sought out Father Anthony and knelt at his feet. Please forgive me, gasped the exhausted young friar. Father Anthony helped the young friar to his feet. Of course I forgive you, he said. He gave the young friar good advice, and the young man soon became an exemplary Franciscan. Father Anthony sometimes worked miracles of healing, too. After he finished preaching in one town, a weeping family brought a young man to him who had just died. Restore him to us, they begged him. Father Anthony blessed the man, and he returned to life. Preaching in a certain place one day, Father Anthony realized that he had not made arrangements for that night's lodging. A kind nobleman offered Father Anthony hospitality at his home, and he gratefully accepted. He provided Father Anthony with a room for the night, and saw to it that his guest had all he needed. Then the nobleman went to his own bedroom right next door to Father Anthony's, and went to bed. In the middle of the night, he was awakened by a blazing, bright light. Fearing that his home was on fire, the nobleman raced into the hallway, but he did not find a fire. He saw that the bright light was coming from under the door of Father Anthony's room, and he could hear the sound of voices within. The curious man went over and looked through a crack in the door into Father Anthony's room. Father Anthony was kneeling before a table with an open book upon it, and he held in his arms a most beautiful child who blazed with the most beautiful light that the man had ever seen. Father Anthony and the child spoke to one another, and all at once the man realized that Father Anthony was speaking to the Christ child. People brought him those who were paralyzed, and those who had seizures. These diseases were impossible to cure, 
but he cured them completely by blessing the sufferers with the sign of the cross. Sometimes, Father Anthony had to take drastic action. The town of Rimini was in a dreadful state due to the crimes of the heretics, or faithless people. Father Anthony preached to the people for many days, using many examples from Scripture to convince the people to give up their crimes and come back to the light of faith. But the people were stubborn and would not come back to faith in Christ. They even refused to listen to Father Anthony any more. So Father Anthony prayed, and he received an inspiration from God. He walked to the mouth of the nearby river, which flowed into the sea, and he stood on the sandy bank between the river and the sea. Some of the curious townspeople followed him, just to see what he would do. Raising his voice, he called to the fish, You fishes of the sea and river, listen to the word of God, since the faithless heretics refused to hear it. Then an amazing thing happened. An enormous crowd of many colored fish swam toward the bank from the sea, and another crowd of fish swam in from the river. With slow, graceful strokes of fins and tail, large fish came and placed themselves in the deep water in front of Father Anthony. Medium-sized fish swam in briskly, and smaller fish hurried in. All the fish arranged themselves in order, the smallest fish near the shore, the largest fish in the deeper water and back, and the medium-sized fish in the middle. As more and more fish arrived, they each found a spot to stay, and each remained in its place calmly and in perfect order. Each fish raised its face out of the water and gazed at Father Anthony, peacefully waiting for his words to them. The scales of the fish shimmered rainbow colors in the light. No one had ever seen such an orderly gathering of fish before. Attracted by the amazing sight, more and more of the townspeople came to watch. Father Anthony began to speak. My brothers the fish, you should give as many thanks as you can to your Creator who has granted you such a noble element as your dwelling place, so that you have fresh and salt water, just as you please. Moreover, he has given you many refuges to escape from storms. He has also given you a clear and transparent element, and ways to travel, and food to live on. Your kind Creator also prepares for you the food that you need even in the depths of the ocean. When He created you at the creation of the world, He gave you the command to increase and multiply, and He gave you His blessing. Later during the flood, when all the other animals were perishing, God preserved you alone without loss. He has also given you fins so that with that additional power you can roam, wherever you wish. It was granted to you, by order of God, to keep alive Jonas, the prophet of the Lord, and to cast him onto dry land safe and sound on the third day. You offered the tribute money to our Lord Jesus Christ, when as a poor man he had nothing to pay the tax. You were chosen as food for the eternal King, our blessed Lord Jesus Christ, before his resurrection and in a mysterious way afterwards. Because of all these things you should praise and bless the Lord, who has given you so many more blessings than to other creatures. In this way, Father Anthony continued to preach to the fish. As he preached, more and more fish came and took their orderly places to listen to him. As they heard his words, the fish opened their mouths and nodded their heads in reverence to God. They were praising God as much as they could. Seeing the reverence of the fish, Father Anthony exclaimed, Blessed be the eternal God because the fishes of the waters give God more honor than heretical men, and animals lacking reason listen to his word better than faithless men. More and more of the people of Rimini gathered to witness the miracle and to hear the words of Father Anthony. They were amazed to see the fish listening so patiently and reverently to Father Anthony. When they heard him praise the fish, their hearts were struck with remorse for their sins and they all sat down on the ground so that he could preach to them. Father Anthony spoke so wonderfully to them about the truth of the Catholic faith that all the citizens of Rimini who were listening to him were converted back to faith in Christ. They begged him to stay with them for a few days and preach to them some more, and he promised that he would. So he dismissed the people for the day, and they returned home rejoicing, confirmed in the faith. Then Father Anthony dismissed the fish and gave them God's blessing. They all departed, each swimming back to its home. They expressed their rejoicing by diving and leaping and soaring in and out of the water on their way. Father Anthony had special compassion for sinners. After living for many years in open defiance of God, some of them were so ashamed of their sins that they doubted that they could partake of God's mercy. 
some were afraid to approach God and ask his forgiveness after a lifetime of crimes. But Father Anthony knew what to say to them. Per sinner, why despair of thy salvation, since all here speaks of mercy and of love? Behold the two advocates who plead thy cause before the tribunal of divine justice, a mother and a redeemer Mary, who presents to her son her heart transfixed with the sword of sorrow, Jesus, who presents to his father the wounds in his feet and hands, and his heart pierced by the soldier's lance. Take courage! With such a mediator, with such an intercessor, divine mercy cannot reject thee. These words gave courage to many converted sinners, and started them on the path toward heaven. But some people just would not change their ways. There was a man in the town of Florence who was a miser. He gathered more and more money for himself and hoarded it. He turned a deaf ear to the poor and needy, and lived only to accumulate more and more money. Finally, he died, and Father Anthony preached at his funeral on these words of Jesus found in the Bible. Where your treasure is, there your heart is also. All of a sudden, in the middle of the sermon, he saw a vision of the rich man in hell. He said to the relatives and friends of the man, The rich man is dead and his soul is in torture. Go open his coffers and you will find his heart. They hurried to the rich man's house and opened his treasury. Lying there, half buried in pieces of gold, was the beating heart of the dead man. Father Anthony knew how to put riches in their proper place. Earthly riches are like the reed. Its roots are sunk in the swamp, and its exterior is fair to behold, but inside it is hollow. If a man leans on such a reed, it will snap off and pierce his soul, and his soul will be carried off to hell he said. Father Anthony was willing to go to any lengths to save a soul. In the French city of Bourges lived a merchant named Gilad. Gilad was a decent man, but he was opposed to everything that the Catholic Church teaches. He heard the preaching of Father Anthony many times, but yet still did not believe. He had a special difficulty believing in the real presence of Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament. How is this possible? He asked, and would not believe? One day, he approached Father Anthony with an offer. Father Anthony, if you could prove to me the truth of the real presence of Jesus in the blessed sacrament with some outward sign, with something I could see, then I will embrace your church and all its beliefs. Do you accept? asked Gillet. I accept, said Father Anthony. I have a meal that I will keep under lock and key for three days, said Gillet. During the three days I will feed him nothing at all and then I will bring him to the town square. I will approach him with a measure of oats for him to eat, and you will approach him with a monstrance holding your blessed sacrament, which you say is the true body of Christ, the Son of God. If he ignores my oats and kneels in worship of your blessed sacrament, then I will accept all that your church teaches and become a Catholic. So for three days, Gilad gave no food to his trusty meal, which became hungry indeed. Father Anthony fasted and prayed during the same three days, for he knew that the salvation of a precious soul was at stake. Gillard and his friends ate and drank and joked about the defeat that was sure to come to Father Anthony in the town square. And all the townspeople talked among themselves, and wondered what would really happen. Finally, the day of decision arrived. The town square was crowded with people who were curious to see what would take place. Gillard finally arrived leading his mule to the front of the square, followed by his friends who were laughing and joking. Then Father Anthony walked into the square carrying the monstrance, which held the blessed sacrament. All of a sudden, the curious crown hushed. Father Anthony walked slowly and reverently, his eyes downcast in prayer. Following him was a huge throng of people who were singing hymns softly and praying quietly. The mule was brought forward to stand in front of everyone. Gillard brought out the oats and offered them to the hungry meal. At the same moment, Father Anthony stepped forward with the monstrance, and he spoke to the meal. In the name of thy Creator, whose body I, though unworthy, hold in my hands, I enjoin and command thee, O being deprived of reason, to come here instantly and prostrate thyself before thy God, so that by this sign unbelievers may know that all creation is subject to the Lamb who is daily immolated upon our altars. The hungry mule did not turn to the oats at all. It turned toward Father Anthony and walked up to him. It bent its knees and knelt down in front of the monstrance in an attitude of adoration, remaining there for a long time. 
The faithful people rejoiced, sinners repented and came back to the faith, and the unbelievers ran and hid. Gilad nodded slowly in recognition of what had happened. I will become a Catholic, he said without hesitation. Not only Gilad but his whole household joined the church. To commemorate the event, and to thank God for the gift of faith, Gilad built the church of St. Peter in Bourges on the very spot of the miracle. Father Anthony had walked the roads of Europe to teach God's children. He had fasted and kept vigils to pray for them. He said M for them, heard their confessions, and buried them. He had labored ceaselessly in the vineyard of the Lord, and finally his body was worn out. Knowing that he would die soon, Father Anthony one day came upon an enormous walnut tree in a field. In fact, its leafy boughs were so long that they seemed to cover a field all by themselves. The owner gladly gave him permission to stay in it so Father Anthony wove some thin branches together to make a sort of room on one of the broad branches. Here in the tree he stayed for the last two weeks of his life. Here he finished writing one of his commentary books, and here he prayed. Two brothers stayed with him by the tree, and when he fainted one day, they flagged down a passing farm wagon and put Father Anthony aboard. Take me to Padua, to die with my brethren there, he managed to whisper. But he took a turn for the worse so they stopped at the convent of the poor Clares, or the Franciscan sisters who followed Sister Clare, the great friend of Brother Francis. Some of his fellow Franciscan friars were there, and one of them heard his last confession. As the friars planned to anoint him in the sacrament of extreme unction, he said, I already possess that unction within me, but it is good to receive it outwardly. Father Anthony roused himself out of his weakness one last time and in a loud voice he sung his favorite hymn to Our Lady, one called O Gloriosa Domina. Brother Roger supported him in his arms, seeing Father Anthony gaze with intensity on something, he asked, What do you see? I behold my God, whispered Father Anthony. He gazed upward for a half an hour, then he sank back and died. He was only thirty-six years old. They buried him in Padua, and he was canonized a saint only a year later. St. Anthony made plans all his life, like we all do, but few of his plans worked out. Instead, he accepted what happened and moved forward in a new direction. For example, he planned to stay at Santa Cruz with the Augustinians, but became a Franciscan instead. He planned to preach to the people of North Africa, but he accepted his sickness instead. He planned to sail back to Portugal, but landed in Sicily instead. He planned to serve the Franciscans in an active way, but he was assigned to an out-of-the-way hospice in the mountains instead. He planned to remain silent, but preached a sermon when he was asked to do so. He went to great lengths to save souls, and wore himself out and died doing so. God was so pleased with St. Anthony's abandonment to his providence that he seems to grant all of the prayers he makes on our behalf. This is why St. Anthony is called upon to intercede for us so much. Even the lemon tree he planted at Messina is still bearing fruit centuries later. Saint Anthony is the patron saint of sailors, and farmers call upon him to bless their seeds, their land, and their crops. Parents call upon him to ensure the safety of their children, and travelers call upon him to make their journeys safe and successful. To the poor and hungry, he provides ready help, and many of the sick who persevere in prayer to him are made well. Young women ask his prayers to help them find good husbands. Most of all, St. Anthony is known for finding lost things. What he is best at is finding lost souls. Miracles Work During the Life of St. Anthony by B. Lockwood Ingersoll The Miracle of Tongues Among the saints of the church few are better known than the great St. Anthony of Padua. Endowed with great natural gifts, enjoying excellent health, a powerful voice, combined with real eloquence, an admirable delivery, a perfect knowledge of the scriptures and theology, he was, soon after his ordination, sent to preach in France, Italy and Portugal. Although in his youth he had never spoken anything but Portuguese, he, like the apostles after Pentecost, received that wonderful gift of tongues, which not only enabled him to preach even with eloquence in French and Italian, but to make himself understood by people from all parts of the world. An instance of this may be given. When ordered by the Holy See to preach the Lenten sermons at Rome, he was perfectly understood by the immense multitude from all nations, 
whom the renown of his great sanctity and marvelous gifts had attracted. This same gift was of most frequent occurrence during his missionary career. Dumb animals obey the saint. There was near the monastery of the Friars Minor, at Montpellier, a large pool filled with frogs, whose perpetual croakings greatly disturbed the saint and his community. At last, wearied by this perpetual noise, he determined to put an end to it, and going to the pond, after blessing it, ordered the frogs to stop their croaking, which at once ceased, and the pond from that time was called St. Anthony's Pond. But stranger still, if a frog was taken out of this pond and placed in another, it instantly recovered its power of croaking, while it was just the reverse were a strange frog put into St. Anthony's Pond. The Sermon to the Fishes at Rimini during the eleventh and twelfth centuries Europe had much to suffer from various heresies, more especially from that of the Albigenses, which infested the south of France and north of Italy. God, ever watchful over his spouse, the Church, soon raised up two great men, St. Francis and St. Dominic, who, with their sons, came to her assistance. St. Anthony of Padua, on account of his great sanctity and learning, was chosen by his superiors to be one of the first to enter the battlefield. Rimini, in Romania, in spite of all the endeavors of the Holy See and of its own saintly bishop, continued to remain the hotbed of heresy, and here it was St. Anthony began his arduous task of conversion. The heretics, on hearing who was to enter the lists against them, were filled with dismay, but instigated by the evil one, resolved at any cost to face their enemy. The saint on his arrival met with the reverse of a cordial reception. The church in which he was to begin his labors was empty, save for a few old men and women. But his longing for the glory of God and salvation of souls was too great to make him hesitate for a moment. He therefore ascended the pulpit, and preached with such earnestness and zeal that the heretics, on hearing about it, determined to leave nothing undone to get rid of one who was so dangerous an opponent. This great servant of God, being informed of their intentions, withdrew to a remote part of the city, to prepare himself by prayer, fasting and penance for the encounter, imploring at the same time the mercy of God on this poor benighted people. His enemies had, however, not lost sight of him, and on seeing him leave his retreat, some of them followed him to the place where the river Marecchia empties itself into the Adriatic. Here the saint stopped and in a loud voice commanded the fishes of the sea and river to come forth and listen to the word of God, saying, Come, ye senseless fishes of the deep, and by your attention to the word of your God and mine, put to shame these men, who in their blindness and hardness of heart refused to hear it. The words were barely out of the saint's mouth before a great commotion was noticed in the sea. Thousands of fishes of every size and species were seen to come in the greatest order to its surface the smaller ones placing themselves in front, and the larger ones behind. Then began one of the most extraordinary sermons ever preached. The saint addressed them as if they were beings endowed with reason. Oh, ye fishes of the deep, praise and thank your God and Creator for the unspeakable blessings he has lavished on you, favoring you above all dumb animals. See and admire the beautiful home he, in his infinite goodness, has prepared for you. Look at those crystal waters in which it is so easy for you to find a refuge against the storm and the enemy. Not only has he provided for all your wants, but he has made you prolific above all other creatures. You alone have been exempted from the dominion of your fellow beings and from his wrath at the time of the deluge. To you it has been given to save his prophet Jonas, to cure his blind servant Tobias, to be the food of the penitent, to procure for the Savior of mankind and his disciples the tribute money due to Caesar. It was after his resurrection by eating of your flesh he proved he was truly risen from the dead. It was over your heads he walked on the sea, and after the great draught of fishes, he called his apostles fishers of men. The fishes seemed to be filled with admiration, and anxious not to lose one of his words, their numbers ever increasing, marking their approval by the lifting up and down of their heads, the opening of their mouths. But not one of them thought of leaving the spot till the saint had blessed them and ordered them to return to their homes below, when they immediately disappeared. But the commotion of the waters continued for some time after. In the meantime, so deep had been the impression made upon the bystanders, eyewitnesses of this remarkable scene, that many hastened back to the city, imploring their friends to come and see the mirror. Ackley, others burst into tears, 
and kneeling at the feet of the saint, implored forgiveness, while only a few remained obdurate in their heresy. Saint Anthony, availing himself of this opportunity, at the close of the sermon to the fishes addressed the immense multitude now gathered together, exhorting them to repentance, rebuking them for their unbelief and ingratitude, pointing out to them the heinousness of sin, and showing them what a lesson of obedience the fishes had just given them. It was through this sermon that Rimini was purged from heresy. Why Saint Anthony is invoked for lost and the slayed things The following incident in the life of Saint Anthony accounts for his being invoked for lost and the slayed articles. During his stay at the Franciscan monastery at Montpellier Saint Anthony was not only engaged in preaching, but also in teaching theology to his younger brethren. It was here a most extraordinary adventure happened to one of his novices. The latter, weary of the monastic life, suddenly left the monastery, taking with him a book of psalms, copied and annotated by the saint for the benefit of his pupils. The loss of this book was deeply felt by Saint Anthony, as books at that time were only written, the art of printing being unknown, an ordinary book costing at least a hundred dollars of our money. In the year 1240 the monks had commodly paid as much as two hundred gold ducats for an illuminated missal. See History of Pope Innocent III, Volume 4. Whole fortunes sometimes were spent in the purchase of a single book. What pained the saint even more than the loss of a work invaluable to him was the outrage committed against God and the spiritual danger threatening the culprit. The saint, with his usual trust in God, at once betook himself to prayer, humbly imploring the divine mercy on the unhappy youth and at the same time asking for the restitution of his book. His prayer was barely finished before it was heard. Just at that moment, as the thief was about to cross a bridge, the devil, in the shape of a hideous negro, appeared before him with an axe in his hand, threatening at once to kill him and trample him underfoot if he did not immediately retrace his steps. The novice, terrified at the sight of the monster, hastened to obey, and falling at the feet of the servant of God, not only gave back the book, but implored forgiveness, begging to be readmitted into the monastery. The saint, full of gratitude to God, readily forgave the culprit, warning him at the same time against the snares of the devil and encouraging him to persevere in his holy vocation. The stolen book has been for years preserved in the Franciscan monastery at Bologna. A messenger from hell unmasked? While the saint was preaching at Puy a messenger suddenly appeared in the midst of the congregation calling out to a lady in a loud voice that her son had been foully murdered by his enemies. Anthony, who easily discovered who the messenger was, commanded silence by a motion of his hand, and, after consoling the lady by telling her that her son was never in better health in his life and that she would shortly see him, added that the supposed messenger was no other than the evil one, who had only come in the hopes of disturbing the sermon and marring its effects. This proved perfectly true, as the pretended messenger at once vanished. The saintly preacher then availed himself of the opportunity thus presented to him to warn his hearers against the artifices of the evil one, the consoler of mothers. Whilst that bribes God glorified his servant by making him work many miracles, a poor woman had gone to hear the saint preach, leaving her child alone, with no one to take care of him. During her absence the little one fell into a cauldron of boiling water and on her return she found him playing unhurt in his dangerous bath. But a greater miracle than that was worked on another occasion. A mother having left her infant at home by itself, in order to go and hear the sermon, found him on her return dead in his cradle. In the midst of her grief she rushed back to the church and informed the saint of what had taken place. Go home, he replied. Your son liveth making use of the same words as our Lord did when the father asked him to cure his son. Full of confidence in St. Anthony, she hastened back, and to her great joy, found the baby up and playing with his little companions. The rain respects the friend of the saints. It happened one day that the cook of the monastery at which the saint was staying had nothing to give the brethren to eat, and went and told Anthony of his difficulty. The saint at once went to see a pious lady he knew, begging her to have compassion on his brethren and send them a few cabbages. So great was the veneration in which he was held that she immediately, in spite of the inclemency of the weather, for it was pouring rain, ordered her servant to go into the garden and cut as many vegetables as the monks would require. The maid obeyed and took them to the convent. 
Notwithstanding the drenching rain, she returned home perfectly. Dry and full of admiration, said to her mistress, When you want something done for Father Anthony or the other monks, do pray send me. I would not care if the weather was a thousand times worse than today. See, there is not a drop of rain on my clothes and my shoes are not even damp. The lady, full of admiration, earnestly recommended the monks to the care of her only brother, a canon and noblet, entreating him to assist them, as far as lay in his power, and to rest assured that God would reward him a hundredfold for his charity. An Extraordinary Prophecy While the saint was at his monastery at Puy he used sometimes to meet a lawyer, who led a very bad and profligate life. Every time they met the saint would uncover his head and bow most respectfully to him. Thinking the servant of God was only laughing at him, the lawyer one day turned round and said to him, If I did not fear the judgment of God I would soon make you repent of insulting one who has never injured you, by thrusting my sword through your body. The saint replied that, far from having any intention of insulting him, he only bowed through a feeling of deep love and respect, for in thus saluting him he was saluting one who was to be a glorious martyr, and begged of him, when undergoing his tortures, not to forget him in his prayers. The lawyer for the time being laughed at what seemed to him to be a most unlikely thing. Strange to say, the prophecy was shortly afterwards fulfilled. A bishop started for Palestine, with the intention of converting the Saracens, and urged on by a secret impulse from heaven, the lawyer followed him. On his arrival he was suddenly filled with such a desire to convert the infidels that he himself at once began to preach the truths of the Christian religion to them and point out the wickedness of Mohammedanism, which so enraged these fanatics that after making him a prisoner and torturing him for three days, they put him to death. When about to die he revealed to those present how the saintly Father Anthony had predicted his martyrdom, declaring at the same time that a great prophet had risen in their midst. Saint Anthony the Consoler of Persecuted Women Saint Anthony always took a great interest in women in distress, or persecuted, and they therefore look on him as their special protector. Among those who, owing to the sanctity of the Franciscans, held them in great veneration and aided them in their daily wants, was a lady who suffered much from a jealous and irritable husband. One evening, after finishing some work and making some purchases for the brothers, finding it too late to take them to the monastery that night, she took them home with her. This so greatly roused the anger and jealousy of her husband that, not content with loading her with reproaches, he pulled almost all her hair off her head. The poor woman was naturally greatly hurt at such treatment, but full of confidence in her good father Anthony. After carefully gathering up all her hair, she wrote, begging of him to call on her the next day. Her trust in the saint was not misplaced. After hearing her story he immediately on his return to his monastery, summoned his community together, and begged of them to unite with him in praying for their benefactress. These prayers were not in vain, for before they were finished the pain left her and her head was covered with hair, as if nothing had happened. The sight of this miracle was not only the means of converting her husband, but also of making him a great benefactor to the monastery. Truth from the Lips of a Little Child Saint Anthony, when traveling through Romania, not only visited Padua, but also Polsain and Ferrara. He remained some time in the last place and worked a miracle as touching in its circumstances as it was beneficial in its results. A nobleman in that city had married a lady of remarkable beauty and highly gifted. Her rare talents, winning manners and accomplishments soon made her a general favorite in society. Niche so incensed her husband and excited his jealousy that it was hardly possible for her to live with him, and their home became one scene of continual strife. The birth of a lovely boy, far from bringing peace to the unhappy couple, only increased the suspicions of the wretched father, who now, under the complete power of the evil one, determined to destroy both mother and child. Whilst he was thus fostering these evil thoughts in his mind, Saint Anthony came to preach a mission in this city, and the lady, like Susanna of old, came to this new Daniel, certain that she would through his intercession obtain the conversion of her husband. What follows will show how success attended the prayers of the servant of God. Not long afterward, whilst this gentleman and several others were talking together with the saint on the public square, the mother, as if inspired by God, sent the nurse to take a walk with the infant. 
At the sight of the child the jealous husband bit his lips with vexation and anger. Saint Anthony, on the contrary, drew near the nurse and began caressing the child, asking him, as if in a joke, Who is your father, my little one? The bystanders smiled at this childish question. But the servant of God had an object in view, the justification of the innocent. The little babe, only a few weeks old, smilingly turning his face to where his father stood, replied in a clear voice, to the astonishment of all present, There is my father! St. Anthony, putting the child into the arms of the now delighted parent, said, Take the child and never again doubt he is your son, since he himself has told you so. The happy husband at once carried him home in triumph to his mother, and from that time peace and joy reigned in this favored household. The news of this event spread far and wide, and there is a memento of it to be seen sculptured in marble in the chapel of the saint at Padua. Broken goblet and running barrel. The vicar general of the Franciscan order, Brother Elias, on the death of the saintly founder, Saint Francis of Assisi, in a pathetic circular convoked all the superiors of the various provinces to attend a general chapter, in order to proceed to the election of his successor. It was probably in the autumn of A. D. 1226 that Anthony, accompanied by one of his brethren, went to Italy, passing through Provence in order to be present at this general chapter. On their way through Provence, they stopped to rest at one of the towns, in the house of a pious woman. She, being anxious to pay her weary guests as much respect as she possibly could, borrowed a splendid cut glass goblet from one of her neighbors for them to drink their wine out of. Unfortunately, the companion of the saint, wanting to examine it more closely, took it up in his hand and broke it. This was not the only mishap. The kind hostess, thinking only of the comfort of her guests, forgot to turn the tap of the barrel when she went to draw their wine, and on returning to the cellar found it had all run out. The saint, seeing how distressed she was by these misadventures, bowed his head in prayer, and to the great astonishment of the good woman, who was silently watching him, she saw the broken pieces of the goblet unite together, leaving no mark of breakage. Full of hope, she ran to the cellar, and to her great joy the barrel, which before the occurrence was half empty, was now filled with the most delicious wine. St. Anthony, in his deep humility, at once continued his journey to Italy, so as to avoid the applause awaiting him as soon as the news of this fresh miracle got abroad. The Carved Capon St. Anthony was one day invited by a party of heretics to come to dine with them, in order— as they said, to give them the opportunity of laughing at his stupidity. He good-naturedly accepted their invitation. After sitting down to table a large bat, such as are found in Sicily, was served up to him, with the request to carve it. When, without being the least disconcerted, he began to do so, they could hardly refrain from laughing aloud. But soon their laughter was changed into astonishment for hardly had the saint begun to carve the wretched bird before it was changed into a magnificent capon, emitting the most delicious smell. This miracle so completely changed their hearts that they not only acknowledged the power of the servant of God, but renounced their errors and were received into the church. The Apparition of the Holy Child The friar's minor had no monastery within the walls of Padua, the nearest one, at Arcella, outside the city, being about three-quarters of an hour's walk. It often happened that, owing to the gates being closed early in the evening, it was impossible for the saint on account of his missionary work to return home. But he easily found a night's shelter among his friends, who were only too happy to have him for their guest. Tito Borghese, Count of Campos San Pietro, one of the saint's dearest friends, was among the few whom he honored the most with his presence. This nobleman had so great a veneration for him that he carefully noted down all that took place during his visits, even rising up at night to watch his guests through the keyhole. Once, when thus visiting him, he noticed an extraordinary light piercing through the chinks of the saint's apartments. Anxious to discover the cause of this, he drew near, and to his great surprise saw through the cracks of the door Saint Anthony holding a beautiful child in his arms, whom he was lovingly caressing. His host was first at a loss to understand how this lovely infant had entered the apartment of his guest, but soon discovered, through his majestic bearing and the rapture of St. Anthony, that the child was no other than our Divine Lord, who, under this form, had come to console, encourage and strengthen his faithful servant. 
The apparition lasted some time, then suddenly disappeared, leaving the room in total darkness. At once the saint rose from his prayers, and on going to his bedroom, knocked against his host in the dark. As if guilty of a crime, he entreated his friend not to betray his secret. During the lifetime of Saint Anthony the Count faithfully kept his word, but after his death, with tears streaming down his face, he gave a minute account of everything that had taken place. The heavenly light, of a bluish color, issuing forth from the divine child, although brighter and more beautiful than the sun, did not dazzle the eye, whilst at the same time the heart was filled with unutterable joy. He, moreover, declared that the holy child himself had informed the saint, by pointing to the door with his finger, that he was watched. But that saint Anthony appeared to pay no attention to this, as if anxious not to deprive his friend of this heavenly consolation. He furthermore added that the holy child was standing on the breviary of the saint. This apparition has been so frequently mentioned by old historians that its veracity cannot be doubted. It is for this reason St. Anthony is usually represented with the holy child standing on his breviary. Where thy treasure is, there also is thy heart. Among the many vices infesting Florence, usury was the one against which the saint waged the greatest war. St. Bonaventure himself relates an occurrence which took place in that city, and of which St. Anthony availed himself in one of his sermons to illustrate how severely God punishes that vice. A rich usurer died and whilst the saint was in prayer God revealed to him that this man's soul was in hell on account of his unjust dealings with others. An immense crowd of people had gone to hear the saint preach the funeral sermon. He at once, on ascending the pulpit, began by pointing out the heinousness of the sin of usury, declaring that usurers in their thirst for gold were the enemies of mankind, desiring nothing so much as war, famine, pestilence, and so forth, so as to enrich themselves at the expense of others, and satisfy their craving for those riches in which their happiness alone consisted. Then, speaking with still greater emphasis, he exclaimed, They are also the enemies of their own souls, for it is indeed rare for a usurer to become holy. Adding, This is precisely what has happened to the one to whom these last honors are being paid. And pointing to the catafalque before him, he continued, To prove the truth of my assertion you need only go and look at the chest of money which, for the short time he lived on earth, was the joy and God of his heart, and you will find there that heart lying under his gold. For the Son of God himself has declared, Where thy treasure is there also is thy heart. The people at this announcement remained at first perfectly dumbfounded, after which crowds of them rushed to the house of the deceased in order to ascertain for themselves the truth of this assertion, insisting upon the chest being opened, and there, to their great astonishment, found the heart still warm, lying under the gold. But not yet fully convinced of the truth, they again returned to the church where the corpse was lying, and on opening the body found no heart in it. Filled with indignation against the usurer, they declared his body should not be buried in consecrated ground, and taking it off the catafalque, dragged it out of the city and threw it on a place where dead beasts were buried. This wonderful occurrence did not fail to produce a good and lasting impression on the people. From that time usury was almost stamped out of Florence, but the respect and veneration in which St. Anthony was held were such that he and his companion fled from the city to seek the solitude of empty Alvernia. St. Anthony Cures a Cripple Whilst the saint was at Padua youth called Leonardo accused himself in confession of having kicked his mother so violently that she fell to the ground. St. Anthony, wishing to make him understand the enormity of his crime, said to him, the foot of one who kicks father or mother deserves to be cut off. The young man did not understand his words in the sense he meant them, and on returning home actually went and chopped off the foot with which he had kicked his mother. This news soon reached the ears of the saint, who at once went to see the youth. After making the sign of the cross upon the mutilated limb both leg and foot were again joined together, without leaving any mark. Wind and rain obey Saint Anthony. Another extraordinary occurrence took place at Bourges, in France, the representation of which was long to be seen carved on one of the portals of the cathedral. Owing to the vast crowds who wanted to hear the saint preach, it was found impossible for any of the churches or squares within the city to contain them. It was therefore decided to hire a large field outside the city walls, and the people, headed by the canons and clergy, walked in procession to the place. 
Fortunately, it was summer. When St. Anthony began his first sermon the weather was magnificent, but suddenly the sky became overcast, a high wind began to blow, dark clouds were seen floating in the air, and distant peals of thunder were heard. The immense crowd became alarmed and began to think of seeking shelter, when the saint, noticing the movement, quietly said to them, Do not be frightened, remain in your places, not one drop of rain will touch you. Full of confidence in his words not one left and St. Anthony continued his sermon in the midst of a most terrific hail and thunderstorm, and neither the saint nor his vast congregation received one drop of rain. Even the ground on which they stood was perfectly dry, just in the same manner as when ages before the Israelites passed through the waters of the Red Sea. At the sight of the miracle a hymn of praise and thanksgiving to that God whom the rain and winds obey burst forth from the lips of all those present, who were also filled with still greater respect and veneration toward one whom God so highly favored. Cure of a Paralyzed Child One day after his sermon, as the saint was hurrying back to his monastery, in order to avoid the applause of the multitude, he was stopped by a man carrying in his arms a little girl, both of whose feet were paralyzed, so that it was impossible for her to walk. Besides this, she suffered from epileptic fits of extraordinary violence. The unhappy father, full of confidence in the saint, determined to ask his assistance, and kneeling at his feet, holding the little one in his arms, implored him to bless her. Filled with pity for the unhappy parent, Saint Anthony immediately did as requested. On his return home the poor man, certain his child was cured, placed her on the ground, making her stand, holding by the rail of a bench. Shortly afterward, when she began to take a few steps, he gave her a stick, but soon that was discarded, and Padavana, full of glee, was seen running about the room, perfectly cured. From that time she never suffered either from epilepsy or paralysis. These wonderful cures were almost of daily occurrence, so that the same thing could have been said of the saint as of our Lord. He went about doing good and curing all.